Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Geoscience Australia Wednesday seminar. My name is Marie Wilson. I'm the branch head of the National Earth and Marine Observations Branch here at Geoscience Australia. Uh, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'll also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people participating in our seminar today. So this morning's seminar is Cretaceous to Cenozoic Controls on the Genesis of the Shelf Incising Perth Canyon, insights from a two-part geomorphology mapping approach. The presenter today is Dr. Rachel Nansen. The Perth Canyon is Australia's second largest submarine canyon and its elongate and continental shelf incising morphology contrasts with Australia's more prolific slope confined canyons. This seminar will describe the application of a new internationally collaborative mapping approach to capture the complexity of the canyon and to link its modern morphology to subsurface data and thereby re reconstruct its geological evolution. So a few words about our speaker. Dr. Rachel Nansen is a geomorphologist with experience in theoretical and applied environmental research. She studied at the University of Wollongong and the University of New South Wales receiving her PhD in 2006. After postdoctoral research at the ANU and the Australian School of Petroleum at the University of Adelaide, she was employed as a lecturer at the University of Adelaide from 2009 to 2011. She then became a lead principal investigator with the industry funded WAVE Consortium Phase 2 in 2014. In 2017, she moved from academia to the public service to take up the role of marine geomorphologist at Geoscience Australia, where she is now leading the Marine Geomorphology Working Group. Please welcome Rachel to the podium. Thank you, Marie. Thank you for that introduction. And good morning to everyone. And thanks very much for this opportunity to present um, on one of our uh, large marine projects that's uh, coming to fruition at the moment. I'll be presenting on behalf of quite a list of co-authors that represent a diverse range of geoscience specialties uh, and are listed um, at the bottom here. And there's the Perth Canyon in front of you incising that continental shelf. So a bit of an outline on what I'm going to talk about today. First of all, I'm going to provide you with some project context, the, the wider we do what we're doing, and that'll be framed within Geoscience Australia's Strategy 2028. And then I'm going to give you an overview of this new mapping approach uh, that's the international collaboration that Marie mentioned. And then I'll be providing that case application um, on the, the evolution and the genesis of, of the Perth Canyon. Um, before I give you a summary and, and tell you about some of our next steps in this project. So stepping back to the context and before we dive into the Perth Canyon, I'd first like to provide um, the, the Geoscience Australia strategy 2028 context on how and why we do what we do. Um, this strategy uh, defines six key impact areas that you can see listed there. And these are all uh, underpinned by our four pillars of science. And these guide the way in which we do our research and we do our work. Uh, these four pillars are the pursuit of science excellence, making the most of our data, ensuring supportive stakeholders, and enhancing positive organisational culture within Geoscience Australia to maximise our potential and the impact of the work that we do. Um, of these uh, six key impact areas, we're particularly relevant to the marine program, but it's number four, managing Australia's marine jurisdictions, that's particularly relevant to what I'll be talking about today. Geoscience Australia has committed to three sub-themes or, or projects. Uh, within um, key impact number four. And the first of these is really what I'm talking about today, which is mapping and understanding our seabed to support the growth of the blue economy to $100 billion per year. The image you can see in the top right there shows the extent of our exclusive economic zone, our EEZ. This actually represents 4% of the world's oceans and it's twice the size of our terrestrial land mass. So what we're aiming to do is, is uh, not a small thing. It's, um, and it requires really consistency between the industries that will be working in this space to achieve this goal, um, and also uh, more, more globally between uh, regions. So why do we need to map the seafloor geomorphology? Uh, this image illustrates some of the diverse industries that comprise our blue economy and that impact our blue economy. Uh, represented here are the increasing global demand for energy, food and security, and the increased activity within our substantial marine jurisdiction is driving enhanced investment in this space. 
So we're becoming increasingly reliant on this blue economy, which is a significant portion of Australia's economy. The Australian Institute of Marine Science um, uh, published an index of marine industries in 2020, their most recent um, version of this report. And in that, they described that marine has contributed $69.2 billion to our economy in the 2017-18 financial year. This is predicted to grow three times faster than GDP. This is a rapidly evolving space. And by 2025, we're expecting it to be worth $100 billion per annum. And seabed data really underpins these marine industries. Um, and management and the policy that depends on them and helps to manage them. So when I look at um, th that previous slide, I, I, I think, well, geomorphology is really what underpins a lot of those different industries and applications and threats to the blue economy. Um, but we didn't want to take our word for it. So we asked stakeholders, what do they need? What do they need from us? How can we better serve them? And to do that, we asked today consultants to, to undertake an independent survey of, of their needs. And what they've essentially told us is that they need better baseline data. And the type of baseline data that they need um, is to help them to identify biodiversity hotspots so they can help guide their management plans and their developments to the right locations on the seafloor. They also need to know where the no-go areas are. They need to know this early in the process so that they can guide their investment towards viable locations. It's just as useful to tell industry you can't go here than it is to, um, to tell them what's there. And also they wanted to know about bathymetry and seabed makeup. And to me, that, that very much is touching on geomorphology. Um, so geomorphology, geomorphology mapping, why would we produce geomorphology mapping? It's a fundamental derived and interpreted product. It forms the baseline for all those industries I've just outlined. And this is just an illustration of those impacts. So in the top left, you see habitat mapping. To map the habitat, we need to know where the hard surfaces are and where the soft surfaces are. We need to know the genesis or the, uh, the evolution of the seafloor in that location so that we can understand the sorts of impacts uh, that evolution will have on the stability of the seafloor and the chemistry of the seafloor. And that feeds directly into understanding those geohazards that you see in the bottom left, the sediment transport. <clears throat> we need to know which bits of, which bits of the seafloor are stable and where we can in place infrastructure such as pipelines and also where we might have risks posed to safe navigation. You see in the charting example there. And we can feed this sort of into information into improved tsunami hazard modeling. Importantly, we can also use this sort of data to construct uh, sediment budgets and sediment transport pathways. And we can use this in coastal modeling, not just to understand coastal ecosystems better and threats to coast coastal ecosystems, but also to urban communities uh, that are focused in Australia primarily on the coastline. So Australia already has a national scale geomorphology map. This is a seminal piece of work from Heap and Harris in 2008. Uh, this was from Geoscience Australia. Uh, this is a, a product that's been used many times. It's been cited many times in the, in the academic literature. It's also used frequently in, the, um, in, in grey literature. We see it downloaded for a range of different purposes. And within our team, we would use it to help us guide our um, planning for marine surveys. It's very much a fundamental product uh, to so many different aspects of, of marine work. But we need more. If you think about this uh, mapping product um, and the temporal and spatial scales that it represents, it's sitting up here in the right hand corner of um, an area versus time plot. So it represents a large area. Each of those polygons represents a large area of the seafloor. And the features that it's captured that those polygons define evolve over very long periods of time generally. These aren't instantaneous processes. They don't change frequently. But it may be that your survey area lies completely within one of those polygons. So we, while we know that this sort of information is foundational to improve marine planning, uh, we need to go down to the final level of detail. We need to look at those sub-regional marine protected areas. We need to be able to provide a product at that scale and down to the geo feature scale that I'm going to be talking about today for the uh, Perth Canyon. And we also need it down at those local scales to, to understand better the, the localised hazards, um, the infrastructure to, to infrastructure and ecosystems. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what we really, really need is a more universal and multi-scalar ma mapping approach that can meet all of those multi scale, uh, spatial and temporal needs. 
So we wanted to know what the marine, what the Australian marine community also wanted, not just industry, but the, our community of geoscientists and other marine scientists. What would they like to see in an improved, um, finer scale, multi-resolution uh, mapping product? And so we held a workshop in 2018 where we invited marine specialists and managers to give their opinion on some draft ideas, a bit of a straw man that we'd put forward. And what we heard back from them were two things. Firstly, um, this idea that we already have a lot of classification systems in the marine world and in the coastal world. There, there are a lot of um, uh, well-established and highly cited classification systems. Do we need another one? Uh, it seems to be about the last thing we need is another uh, discrete classification system. The other thing that we identified, and this was very much drawing on work emerging from Europe, was that we need to break down our geomorphology mapping into two discrete steps. So often we see interpretations made of the seafloor geomorphology when we really don't have the information to support that subsurface interpretation. So we just need to slow that down a step and the community gave us this feedback and, and said that they also agree. We need to look at the seafloor morphology as a discrete step from then applying uh, the geomorphic interpretation to those features. So I'm going to demonstrate this um, with this single image here at the top of what in, in the morphology system we would define as a ridge. It doesn't need to have a genetic association with it, it's just a morphological feature, it's a ridge and the bathymetry gives us that shape and we can define that shape using a shape file in a GIS program. But when we can get, uh, we can stack further data sets on that, we can start to make interpretations of the subsurface. So the sort of data that we need to do that are backscatter, seismic, grain size. And you can see these two alternative and very different interpretations of that ridge that you saw in the bathymetry. On the left hand side, you see an active bed form. The subsurface information and the grain size data and the, um, the backscatter that you can see illustrated on the left hand side in that very real example from uh, Darwin Harbour shows us that um, rather than having one of these active bed forms, we actually have a paleo bed form. It's a relic bed form. It's the example on the right there. So rather than large amounts of sand being transported across the bed and potentially posing a hazard to navigation or posing an opportunity for extraction, we have a, a static bed form. And because we dated it, we know that that bed form is actually a dune and it was developed by aeolian processes about 10,000 years ago when sea level was far below where it is at present. So you can see there's very alternative um, very different outcomes for interpreting this feature in those two different ways. So those Europeans I just mentioned that we knew were working on this two-part scheme um, were really uh, welcoming to us when we approached them to say we're, we're at a similar uh, point in our process of, of providing a, a more um, updated version of, of sea floor geomorphic mapping. And so we joined the British Geological Survey, the Geological Survey of Ireland and the Geological Survey of Norway to collaborate and provide a revised draft of their early work um, in the form of a glossary, a morphology glossary. To do this, we, in the spirit of not reinventing the wheel, we uh, very much drew on the very um, comprehensive list of undersea feature uh, definitions provided by the International Hydrographic Organization. And what we did was we took those terms, we modified them slightly where there was a little bit of ambiguity or overlap between what we were seeing in our mapping, uh, and we augmented them with a few new terms, not many, just enough to make sure that we had a comprehensive uh, glossary that would define all of the seafloor shapes that we could find at multiple scales. And what you see on the left there is uh, a lookup table that appears early in the Dove and Others second publication there with the link. Uh, it's available online, open access. And if you wanted to map, say, a ridge, as you've just seen in the previous um, example on the previous slide, you don't need to know the genetic origin of that ridge. It may be uh, in the bottom right down here. We provide within the glossary not just the definition, but also the plan form and the cross section profiles of um, example features. And it may be that that ridge is a, some sort of a spur or a bed form. It could be a levee or a contourite. Uh, we don't mind at this step, it's, it's quite a confident step. There's very little ambiguity and very little interpretation required. Now for part two of the scheme, uh, GA are taking a, a role in leading uh, part two of the scheme and in um, pulling together new, um, sorry, not new, <laughs> existing geomorphic classification systems into a new hierarchy. So it's really an exercise in structuring well-established um, classification systems from the field of uh, geomorphology. And because marine 
uh, the marine realm tends to overlap with, with coastal and fluvial systems, rivers and coasts, um, because sea levels constantly going up and down over the millennia. Um, a lot of these discrete settings overlap. So we need to handle that overlap. What we really want to do is come up with a system for organising our onshore to deep offshore classification systems so that they'll make sense and we can provide that seamless mapping um, between environments. And what I put here is just um, a couple of examples of the coastal classification systems that are so well established in our field. We've got uh, Boyd and others um, graphical illustration of changing tide and wave dominance along the shoreline and how you might classify that coastal system. And on the right there is a ternary diagram that shows you the relative amount of wave tide and fluvial processes that have impacted or, or been involved in the, the development of those uh, of the feature you might be mapping. So we don't need to reinvent any of this. Uh, same goes for marine. We have the, the broad scale marine mapping that was completed by Harris and others in 2014. So we have a global broad scale geomorphology map of the seafloor. We've got Australia's Heap and Harris um, uh, national scale um, geomorphic product, but we want to take that down to a, a finer level of detail using similar principles. Excuse me. So just to show you how this looks, and I won't take you through the detail of what you see now, um, but what this shows you is how we've drafted the fluvial classification system. You can see that the first tier is fluvial. We've got our setting. There's a number of settings down the left hand side that we're going to be that the working group is um, is working on at the moment. Uh, but in this example of fluvial, you might map a drainage network. For example, I think of a drainage network off the New South Wales coast. We know on the shelf during low stand that very similar to the sandstone plateau that we saw up high, that we see up high with all of the, um, the, the peatlands and the wetlands behind Wollongong. Um, down on the coastal plain, there used to be a series of very similar looking fluvial systems. So if you wanted to map those out, you would use a fluvial drainage network classification, well established, been around in the field for probably 100 years now, I think, is it dendritic parallel radial. You might also want to map a, a fan if you can find a, a, an alluvial fan that's now drowned. But as you move down through the fluvial classification system, this has been ordered to as a nod towards the fact that these overlap with coastal systems. So the blue is the purely fluvial and the yellow indicates it could be fluvial, it could be coastal or it could be a combination of the two. And so how we handle this and how we structure this into a database is going to be essential. Um, and this smaller image just shows you that overlap between the fluvial and the coastal. So you, you have bleeding from one system into the other. But note that the levels of classification here are entirely defined by existing classification systems. A lot of practitioners who are mapping in these zones, geomorphologists who will be tagging those morphology shape files, already know a lot about the existing classification systems. They really just want a consistent structure between um, regions or between practitioners. And if they want to take it to a finer level of detail beyond the four or so that we've, we've limited ourselves to, they can go there with their bespoke um, classification systems. So to the, to the Perth Canyon and how we've been progressing this scheme and applying it within the Perth Canyon um, to determine just how old it is, how it's evolved and, um, and how we can take that surface morphology that you see in front of you, that spectacular bathymetry data set um, to the subsurface and understand about its evolution and its more recent um, activity. Just to clarify the Perth Canyon um, bathymetry data set has 10 times vertical exaggeration and the ship would have you know, a thousand times magnification. It's just for, for graphical effect. It's an enormous feature. Okay, so the Perth Canyon on the left hand side here, you can see a plan form map. We're looking down on the bathymetry. Um, you can see the yellow shape defines the Perth Canyon Marine Park, part of Australia's important marine park network and a nod to the um, very important ecological value within the, the marine park. Um, but something else I hope you can also see quite quickly is that elongate morphology of the Perth Canyon. It's got quite a sinuous course, it's quite elongate, and you can see those shapes north and south of it, uh, up here and here. These are the blind canyons that are more typical on the Australian margin. And so it's quite a different looking feature, and so it's invoked a lot of interest over the years uh, whether the Perth Canyon is somehow genetically linked to this, what we see now is the tiny little Swan River that comes out near Perth. Could there be a genetic link between the two? If you also look at the um, stratigraphic profile on the right hand side, uh, that's, oh, sorry, this 
line here indicates the position of the profile on the right hand side. Um, and you can see that the canyon has incised through um, uh, abundant strata of the Vlaming subbasin. So the Vlaming subbasin is a narrow Mesozoic rift basin that formed during the Jurassic to early Cretaceous extension between Australia and Greater India. And the basins accumulated up to about 14 kilometres of primarily sin rift sediment. The ultimate breakup of the Indian and Australian margin in the Valanginian, which was in the early Cretaceous, uh, was followed by regional uplift and erosion, fault reactivation and block rotation. And this resulted in the regionally extensive and topographically complex Valanginian unconformity surface that you can see there in red. You can see that there are two major depot centres um, over that. Um, so post breakup subsidence yeah. drove a regional transgression in the early Cretaceous. And this led to the accumulation of deltaic to shallow marine sand and shales that comprise the, the Warnbro group that you can see illustrated there in green. And then there was a switch to open marine conditions which occurred in the late Cretaceous uh, and the accumulation of about a kilometre of mixed siliciclastic and carbonate deposits of the Kuliena group. And subsequently, these are overlain by Cenozoic shelf carbonates. So you can see that the Perth Canyon incises late Cretaceous and Cenozoic strata. And you can also hopefully see that that uh, that those paleobathometric lows of the Bathurst syncline and the Rottnest trough uh, seem to be closely linked to the course of the canyon. So step one of our two-part mapping approach is to look at the morphology of the seafloor, to use that bathymetry, and you can tell a lot by looking at uh, the morphology of the seafloor. Primarily, you can, you can tell a lot about the slope and the sorts of potential that sediment has for being transported and for failure within a system like this, the, the, um, the failure of the canyon walls. Um, so we've run, we've got three scales of bathymetric grid here. We've got the fine resolution grid here at 20 metres. You can see over the canyon proper, outside that canyon area, and within the marine park you have a 40 metre grid, and outside the marine park there's a 250 metre grid. So we have quite a high resolution of grid within the, within the canyon itself. And with that, we've been able to construct a long profile along the canyon. And you can see in the upwater reaches of the canyon, it's a very steep headwall, uh, very high gradient. But as you come down between uh, these transects here, transect A, B, you see them crossing the canyon and they're illustrated up here. Um, as you come down to transect C and D, um, you start to see that the, the gradient really bottoms out. And that's where the canyon is intersected with um, something res more resistant, and it's deflected that canyon northwards. It's been unable to, to modify that immovable um, basement material. And then it increases in gradient as it leaves the canyon at the lower end. Now, this is these gradients are really important to understand what comes next, which is that geomorphic interpretation. What is the setting that is provided for the development of bed forms um, and the like? And note also that there is a smaller uh, tributary canyon to the south there. It's shorter and it's steeper and it's less mature. So the, the long profile of the, the Perth Canyon that's labelled in the figure on the right is really the canyon um, that we want to look at in more detail. So using a series of uh, semi-automation tools, uh, my colleague Zi Huang um, mapped the, the morphology um, using the uh, Dove and others glossary of terms. And you can see on the right hand side, I've put squares around the uh, features that we identified within the canyon and the left hand side shows the distribution of those features. And there's really several major aspects to this that uh, I want to, to draw your attention to, because while we map pretty much the whole area, the morphology of the whole area, uh, we may not want to map every single unit's geomorphology. They're really just the, the units of interest um, for, for, the, for the application. And so we haven't mapped everything, we've just mapped the ones that um, are of interest to our study. But on the northern wall of the canyon and its mid to lower reaches through here, the green is illustrating a series of spurs and gullies that really dominate that northern wall. And they're all about between 1 to 1.6 kilometres in height. So they are just absolutely enormous if you're to be standing at the base of them. Uh, these cliffs go right up and right back. Um, on the southwestern down, downstream walls, you don't really see those mass movements. You tend to see uh, that, that it's primarily in black. Uh, and that's escarpment. It's a pretty vertical wall. There's not a lot. Um, it's obviously quite uh, resistant to collapse. And on the floor of the canyon, you can see uh, it's a little difficult at this scale, but we'll look at these in more detail in a minute. Um, you can see a series of alternating large holes and depressions in the mid reach and at the canyon exit. 
um, down onto the abyssal plain. So our mission next was then to tag the morphology of those features with their interpreted geomorphology. And to do this, we can gain all sorts of subsurface insights from Geoscience Australia's um, various databases and or seabed. And the one that you're seeing on the screen at the moment, I'll first describe the backscatter to you. So we have backscatter intensity, um, it, where we have high backscatter intensity, we have the green colours, through to the lower backscatter intensity, we have the orange colours. And you can see that generally over the canyon, you have that higher backscatter intensity. And that tells us that we've probably got either thinner accumulations of sediment over basement strata, or we have uh, coarser material. And outside the canyon where you have the more orange colours, we have um, lower backscatter, and we tend to have either thicker accumulations of sediment or finer grain sediment. So really that sort of data needs to be interpreted in, uh, relation, in um, parallel with grain size data. And those points you can see distributed across the area uh, are mean grain sizes for all the grab samples that we have within a 20 kilometer radius of the marine path. And what you can see is that up on the continental shelf, those larger orange dots uh, show you um, coarser grain material. As you come down across to the uh, west, you see that the grain size is, is getting smaller down to the sand. And then you see within the canyon a series of tiny dark um, dots, and these are muddy sediments. And that distribution of sediment is, is um, really uh, dictated by the depth of the seafloor. This figure illustrates uh, grain size up the y-axis and depth along the x-axis. And you can see that most of the coarser grain material is restricted to, thank you, the x-axis being the, the depth and the y-axis being the, the grain size. And most of the uh, coarser grain material you, you can see is occurring in less than 500 metres water depth. Um, with one exception, as you come down through the depths down to 4,000 metres and beyond, you see that one sample there of coarse sand. And I'll bring you back over to the map over here. That single sample is taken from here. You see my cursor on the left there, um, and that's that sample just there. And actually that represents a sample taken from the top of this one metre core. So this is um, two 50 centimetre sections of core that we've photographed. The uh, triangles indicate the joins in the photos, so that's not stratigraphically uh, relevant. But what you could also see is that the core is fractured primarily along, along these sharp erosive bases that define the bottom of finding upward bed sets of uh, turbidity deposits. And the, the coarse grain sample we're seeing at the top of that is most likely representing a, a lag of material that's been derived from the winnowing of that material um, with time. So the next data set that we um, targeted for understanding the evolution of some of these features was the NOPIMS database and in-house uh, uh, historic seismic data sets. And what you can see in the top right there is, you see this Valanginian unconformity marked as a white dashed line in each of the figures. You can see there that a large block has um, collapsed over and failed over the surface of that Valanginian unconformity. And this is about a two kilometer long and three or 400 meter high block of material that's, that's glided along that Valanginian unconformity. Um, and its headwall was marked by a shallow fault, whereas you can see deeper faults further up, um, up slope. In the next example, you can see that these deeper rooted faults can actually extend up through the Valanginian and often define the headwalls of a lot of these large mass movement features that you saw mapped earlier. Um, as gullies in, in our morphology uh, map. And this last figure, this last example down here um, is really interesting because we didn't know that we would be able to, to make much of this data. It's from the early 80s. It's very old seismic and it certainly wasn't collected for the purpose of looking at shallow um, stratigraphy. It was for much deeper basin analyses and it was from the 80s. So uh, we were very excited when we opened it up and processed it and had a look at it. And we were able to see these internal dipping surfaces dipping up towards the current direction. And recent work in the marine world uh, in, by marine geomorphologists has been to demonstrate that these are likely to be cyclic steps. These are large accretionary deposits of supercritical flow bed forms. These are from really energetic turbidity current events. And these things migrate up into the flow um, and look just like you can see there. And that core that I showed you on the previous slide was collected from the flank of one of these, right where we see more evidence of turbidity deposits, turbidity, turbidity flows. 
So pulling all that together, um, we produced this geomorphology map, quite a detailed geomorphology map of, of the canyon. And some of that detail I said that we couldn't quite see earlier in the restriction here with inset one. Um, yeah. Is illustrated also up here. And what you can see are those cyclic steps that span the floor of the of the canyon through that constricted reach. It's actually in a reach where the canyon has been particularly restricted and then it is opening up and then you see these these large bed forms um, accumulating where, where they can. And they do it again um, at the exit down here where you see another series of uh, blue holes um, and the orange other cyclic steps at the exit. So importantly, these are both very, very high energy settings within the canyon that either um, uh, restrict flow through the canyon or uh, overstep into the exit and, and thereby increase the energy levels of those turbidity currents. You can also see in the bottom left there a nice illustration of one of these mass movements um, that dominate that northern wall. Interestingly, also, the, the large slab here, um, this large slab here is about 20 kilometres by 20 kilometres. We have seismic that intersects the boundary of that around its peri perimeter in several places. And it looks as though this large thick slab has failed over the Valanginian unconformity as its toe has been destabilised by the ongoing uh, slumping of material from its toe. And the thalweg of the canyon is situated right at the base of those, those slumps. And so it presumably keeps um, every time it, it's uh, erosive, that toe gets more destabilised and you lose um, another slough of material. So how old is the Perth Canyon? We've, we've put together the fact that these are, these are large erosive um, slumps. We can see that um, there's a little bit of, looks like paleo um, uh, geological control on the course of the canyon. But when we looked at, I should have shown you here, sorry, we looked at seismic, um, a much more extensive se seismic data set that's available on the shelf here because of the CO2 sub carbon sequestration project. Um, there's quite dense um, seismic data sets available here. And these seismic data sets extend over here just east of Rottnest Island, but short of the coastline. So we have nothing between the eastern extent of this red shape you can see and the coastline. But this red shape you can see defines the limit of some uh, a swath of incisions, a, a belt of incisions that we can see below the canyon headwall. And the single line through there is what I'm about to show you in that next seismic image. So looking here, what we can see are um, a series of incisions, the first of them through uh, a late Cretaceous surface, which we're calling Paleo, Paleo Valley 1. The second, um, Paleo Valley 2 through the, the mid Eocene and another up here that we think is about 5 million years old. And these uh, incisions correspond to some of the largest, uh, either regionally significant in the case of Paleo Valley 1 or glacius eustatic sea level low stand events. And we know that when sea levels drop, um, canyons can incise or valleys can incise. Valley incision and valley magnitudes, the scale of, of valleys are also um, sensitive to fluvial discharges. And what you can see on the right there is um, the Eocene catchment 40 million years ago, we know that a lot of the channels over the Yilgarn Craton actually flowed south and not west into the Indian Ocean via the Perth, uh, via the, the Swan River. And you can see that um, back in the early Cenozoic, the catchment of the Swan River is indicated in this darker orange here. This was the small catchment that was available um, at that time of Paleo Valley 1. But importantly, this was also a very humid time in Earth's history. So despite the very small catchment that it had, it would have had significant fluvial discharge and that discharge would have provided hyperpictal flows to help incise or to incise the initial Perth Canyon. And we know that at least prior to 5 million years ago, those that extensive paleo drainage network over the Ilgarn Craton was tilted. It, it was tilted towards the west and the Swan catchment enlarged significantly. Um, and it came through Caroline Gap, the researchers uh, Beard and others, uh, Beard and Commander and others um, have shown that Caroline Gap is where that point of capture extended that catchment to include the, all that bright yellow that I've included there. Um, so we may have a drying climate, certainly. Uh, we know that the earth was, was drying over this period, um, but we also know that we've got a much larger catchment. So we've got a low stand, um, we've got glacial eustatic sea level fluctuation, and we've got a decent sized catchment to drive another incision of a smaller Paleo Valley too. Another way of looking at these uh, 
canyons, despite my need to look at geomorphology, is based on their morphology. So you can use their morphology to interpret the way that they may have formed. And what I showed you earlier was this series of cross sections down the canyon. You see from A to A dash and B to B dash all the way down through the canyon. What it shows you is that um, up here at A, the canyon isn't very incised. It's, it's quite a broad and shallow unit. Whereas by the time you get to B and then cross section C, which is down here, it's very much a, a deep and narrow canyon. And what we do is we measure the, the width to thickness um, of these paleo valleys and compare the width to thickness of the modern canyon. And when you have wider relative to their depth, so when a canyon, when a when a channel of any kind is wider relative to its depth, it means it's had lateral expansion. And when we're talking about valleys and incised valleys and canyons, that often means that you've had some sort of alluvial system working its way backwards and forwards to widen it rel relative to its depth. And so what we see here on the, uh, the paleo valleys that coincidentally, um, paleo valley one and two, um, their depth, their actual depth is coincident with the upper reaches of the canyon, which is quite telling for them having had a, a pretty major role in defining the, the majority of that canyon incision. But also when you look at their width to thickness ratios, they're up here, they're, they're 28 or more. Um, now that's quite broad relative to their depth. These are not only are these much smaller um, incisions, but they're also much broader relative to their depth than are the canyon itself. Um, along its entire length. Um, and this really lends support to the idea that these are incised valleys, subaerially sub incised valleys, rather than uh, former canyon courses. Okay. So circling back to why the canyon has the morphology that, or has the course that it has, this image shows the, uh, the two-way time to the depth of the paleotopography of the surface of the Valanginian unconformity. So at the time of um, Paleo Valley 1 incising, it would have been um, very much guided by this paleo uh, topography. And it's really capitalised on the paleobathometric lows of the Bathurst syncline that you can see centrally there and the Rottnest trough. And its northern um, migration has been blocked by the Edward, Edwards Island block um, that was present at the time. It's also capitalised on the, uh, the weakness that the um, significant faulting through what's called the Harvey transfer zone through here. And it's been able to incise down through here while being blocked by the Fasse shelf and abruptly turning northwards. So this canyon hasn't been meandering. It hasn't been a process of, of um, forming its own sinuosity. It seems to be very much inherited from this paleo topography. And also, interestingly, I love it when this happens, but we've gone back to the literature to, to, to really have a look at what the early workers were saying about that connection between the Perth Canyon and uh, the Paleo Swan River. And there's been a lot of uh, research done since the, the early 70s when we used to think that canyons formed from the erosive flows, hyperpicnal flows uh, sourced from river catchments. The whole discipline has evolved through the uh, realisation that that is absolutely not required. It can be part of what causes these incisions, but it doesn't have to be there. And now we bring ourselves full circle to uh, the fact that Quilty did say that there would have been a linkage probably between the Perth Canyon and uh, the Swan River. And Quilty described the, uh, the Paleogene Kings Park formation that filled that uh, initial incision of what they suggested would have been the Perth Canyon. And so I think we've got that, that link um, better established anyway between um, Paleo Valley 1 and the, the canyon that you can see in Perth um, if you go out and have a look at some sections in, in the Botanic Gardens there. So how active is the Perth Canyon? This thing looks recent to us. You, when we first got this really high resolution data set, it struck us that this thing was, it looked really active, it looked really fresh. A lot of these uh, large um, mass movements look like they could have happened only years ago. Um, but then we had an opportunity in 2018, there was a series of very large earthquakes, well, relatively regionally large earthquakes in Western Australia that made the news. And we had um, teams go over there to have a look at the surface uh, deformation from those events that were down here in uh, Southern Western Australia. So quite a way from the head of the Perth Canyon, uh, 300 kilometres southeast of it. And yet the um, modified Mercalli intensity scale in Perth was, uh, what was it? Two to four, which means that looking at it, um, uh, the definitions of these, uh, an earthquake with an intensity of four can shake vehicles, uh, crockery. I mean, there would have been noticeable 
movement. So anything that was sitting on the edge of the canyon, and which, which was about to give way, could um, conceivably have been released by those events. So we um, got in touch with a colleague who was uh, doing a transit survey uh, nearby to go out into deeper water, and we asked them, could you just get us a little more data over the canyon headwall? We'd like to do a differencing analysis between the, uh, the grid that we can make from transit surveys just prior to these events to, to immediately after. So the events were in September and November, and then all the largest events were in September and November of 2018, and we got another grid in December of the same year, and we subtracted one from the other. And the differences you see in the image at the bottom there um, should be considered relative rather than absolute. It's very difficult to do this with, with a, a high degree of accuracy. But you can see that the blue areas indicate accumulation and the red areas indicate the, the loss of height erosion. And what you can see in the headwaters of this are what looks like a gully network, an amphitheater of a gully network that's uh, eroded, that's lost height and potentially been transported down this channel to, to be deposited at this location here. And a little bit uh, similar headwall uh, loss here and localised deposition. So even the biggest, these are the these, these earthquakes rank in the top six or seven of the last 150 years of record that, that we have in our data holdings. So even the very largest of these earthquakes that are occurring in the Perth Cavern, Canyon haven't affected a lot of change, at least along that, that canyon head wall. So it really lends support to the idea that this is a magnificent, but a, um, a very ancient uh, canyon system that's now not doing very much work. So in summary, the Paleo Valley one incised in the late Cretaceous, uh, through a series of major re regional sea level regressions. We had the humid um, climate onshore, though it was a small catchment, and we had erosive hypothetical flows. And onshore, the infill of that canyon um, is recorded as the Kings Park formation that's um, Paleocene to Eocene in age. And Paleo Valley 2, we think, incised in about the Oligocene um, and in response to the initiation of pronounced glaciostatic sea level fluctuations, but also um, because of that capture of the fluvial networks over the tilted Yilgarn craton through Caroline Gap. Um, the alignment of the canyon and its sinuosity is very much inherited from the paleogeography of the Valanginian unconformity, and modern canyon activity is um, relatively low compared to what it was um, in its former glory. So just want to circle back out now to uh, the Marine Strategy 2028. And we've gone into the detail. That's a case example of um, just what you can achieve with that geomorphic interpretation. Um, it's really to, to provide that validity around the science of what we're doing. Um, but I want to just um, come back to those four pillars of um, excellence, of science excellence. And the first of these is pursuing science excellence. And that is something that we've achieved through, or we're aiming to achieve through the standardization of the way that we map the seafloor and the coordination of those local, mid and national scale products. We want to make sure that we have seamless uh, methodologies that we use and also consistency between practitioners and regions. We've done this by uh, collaborating with international and domestic stakeholders um, at every point in, in the process. And we've communicated our results through public seminars and conference presentations, and importantly, most recently with our Perth Canyon paper in marine geology this month to, to really get it out there on, this is what you can do if you do it this way. I think this is also a nice demonstration of how we make the most of our data at GA. We've used um, umpteen databases that, that GA have as holdings, and we haven't, um, these databases haven't been, these, these data haven't been collected for the purpose that we're now using them for, but it really shows what you can do if you, if you want to um, order that data, make it available to people and let them use it in, for, for their own purpose, um, really multi-purpose uh, databases. And we can demonstrate uptake and application of what we've been doing through uptake by Parks Australia and application to our marine parks and our um, uh, development of eco narratives for our marine parks. Um, and also uptake by state government, New South Wales government, we've been talking to about this scheme um, and how to apply it down on, on their uh, continental shelf. We've ensured supportive stakeholders uh, through collaboration, but most importantly, also through that market research. That was a really interesting way of getting objective uh, feedback on what do they want from us? Uh, what sort of product should we be aiming to give them? Um, and to make sure that the product is actually useful. I think an important uh, component of the two-step approach is that some of our stakeholders and some practitioners really only want to go to the morphology level. They really just want to know the shape of the seafloor, uh, how deep is it? 
um, what sort of features can we see there uh, from a morphological perspective? And they don't need to invest in the geomorphology, um, but those that want to take it further and need to take it further to understand those processes and the evolution of the seafloor um, have a consistent framework that they can then bolt on and take it further. And lastly, I've enjoyed um, enhancing positive organisational culture through um, uh, working with people from other teams, uh, geologists, and, and even within our own team, really pulling together um, geoscientists, marine geoscientists with very different specialities uh, to, to come at this from many different angles and to make the most of those multiple databases that we've utilised. Um, and this will ensure that we have um, broader uptake by not just our um, within our own team and within perhaps the Oz Seabed community where people will be using these sorts of derived products, but also across GA. We want to make sure that, um, that others know what we're up to and uh, whether it can be useful um, in their own risk assessments or from marine planning. So I'm just going to finish there with a final thank you uh, for listening. And also just a heads up that if anybody's interested in this two-part scheme, we are presenting a public document um, at the GeoHab um, conference in May uh, remotely and we'll then be taking on board those comments and, and I can include you in that in that process to then represent a revised version of our part two scheme to a, a panel or to a, a workshop of marine geomorphic specialists at the International Conference on Sea 4 Landforms um, in July. So it's very much a time to, to have a look at this and provide that feedback if you're interested. So please email me um, if you're interested. Thank you.